Right. Well, Emmanuel, welcome to uh, our second or third Zoom conversation where I'm, I'm inviting friends of Emmanuel to share their thoughts on the Bible passage for this Sunday morning uh, worship experience in your homes. I highly encourage you, if you haven't read already, pause the video and go read John 20, 24 to 31. It's That's the Doubting Thomas episode. And um, I've got some friends here. We're just going to walk through the passage uh, share some of our thoughts, and then we encourage you after the video to answer the three same questions that we'll be answering, um, and either do it in your small group, call a friend, call somebody, write a letter, invite your grandkids to a FaceTime conversation, and um, and mine the scriptures for the goodness and the truth that's in it. And so with that being said, I'm going to ask my friends to introduce themselves to you, and we'll start with you. Okay. Okay. Um... Hi, I'm Rachel Van Gent. I'm Dan and Tina's daughter and Mariah's mom. Awesome. Thanks for being here, Rachel. Mm -hmm. I'm Kelly Bagdanoff. I'm married to the guy on my screen. He's down in the corner. And I'm ready for this to be done. <laughs> and see you all in person. What, oh, for the actual, the pandemic to be done, not the Pandemic, video. the virus, not, the, not our conversation. I'm good with the conversation. Got it, got it. I'm Steve Bagdanoff, and um, I'm married to the woman in the corner on my screen, and we are apart right now because of uh, the corona thing, uh, just for health concerns for Kelly. So that's kind of why you see us in two different rooms and two different places. I'm in Park and she's in Camarillo. I'm a newly elected session member. Awesome. How are, the, how are you? I mean, Kelly, you've obviously alluded to you're ready for this to be done. How are the three of you doing? How was today for each of you? You can go ahead first, Rachel, if you're, if you okay. want. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, today was good. Today we, uh, we jumped in a little tub and we called it a pool party and we found joy today. And so, you know, there's definitely moments, but today was fun. Awesome. Yeah. I'm still having some health struggles. I have had, this is my third eye infection in four weeks and I'm trying to get healthy enough to head to Arizona where my mom has been put in hospice this week and so I need to get out there and so this week's been a lot of on the phone with doctors hospice nurses arranging care so that's a that's a lot to carry in an already burdensome environment so everyone at Emmanuel watching pray for Kelly thank you all right Steve how about you how was today um, today was very productive. I spent the day working on mission stuff for the church. Um, we had a missions meeting last night. And on the flip side, it was very frustrating because I fell sick on Sunday and went to urgent care on Monday and got a flu test, which came back negative, which then allowed me to force them to give me a COVID test, which is still pending. But what that means is I'm stuck in this room <laughs> uh, listening to my children struggle as they're working to watch a toddler and a two-year-old. And uh, it's been frustrating. I feel like the old man in the room who's doing nothing. And uh, that's, not, that's not good for me. <laughs> so, but I'm okay. I'm, I'm happy. I'm smiling. And I feel good. So, that's great. Well, another, uh, another prayer request for Emmanuel. We'll be praying for the Bagdanovs. Get healthy so you can, you can get out of your quarantine in your homes and from each other. <laughs> So I've asked you to read um, the narrative out of John's gospel, John chapter 20, verses 24 to 31. And we're going to answer three questions and you guys can go in any order you want. But the, the first question is a question I try to always ask myself and anyone as they read scripture. What is it about this passage that troubles you? Is there anything in here that you kind of, you go, wait, what? You know, that, that challenges me or why is this happening or you know, why do they behave in this way? What troubles you about this passage? And anyone can jump in whenever they're ready. Oh, Steve, I was going to let you go first because no, I don't want to steal your thunder. There's too much to say and I could hog the whole time. So I'm, I'm going to be patient. <laughs> okay. I, um, it's not so much the actual passage, but my entire life hearing people talk about it is disturbing because I feel like Thomas gets demonized having doubts that I feel are rational and um, normal and whatever. And whenever I've heard it, it's always been like, 
oh, that you don't want, not, not that you don't want to be Thomas, but it, it, it's, it goes beyond not wanting to be Thomas to kind of, he's kind of demonized and seen as like, he's the bad disciple. It almost, it goes to that length and that disturbs me. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'd always kind of heard that growing up too. And so kind of came into this with that mindset almost. And um, I think the first part that troubled me was just the boldness and audacity in his reaction of just like, unless I see the nail marks, I will not believe. And just like, that just kind of struck me. And then like putting myself in his shoes a little bit more, I was like, okay, imagine the hurt and disappointment and confusion that he must be feeling after giving his life Mm -hmm. to follow Jesus and then have these events that he doesn't understand happen. And so I think that was the first part that originally shook me was just like, Oh my goodness, like his response um, to the disciples saying that they saw him. And then the second part was just after knowing what Jesus, how Jesus responds to him, like what troubled me was that it says a week later. And I think just like, Oh man, just like feeling that tension and wondering what that was like in that middle, in that waiting period. Mm -hmm. Um, was kind of just, it was something that I noticed as I read it this time. Yeah, cool. What about you, Steve? It bugs me that it's uh, in English. (laughs) I think that to piggyback on Kelly's comment about Thomas being demonized, it actually misses the flow of the whole passage. Um, Everybody sees him in this passage. If you walk through and just circle the word saw or see, it happens, it was repeated over and over and over and over again, and he's left out. This is the absolutely normal reaction that you would have. If someone said to you, hey, the guy we just saw die the other day, he's alive. And you go, uh-huh, okay. <laughs> and it bothers me because that's, it's become part of our, our culture in the, in the church, is that it's not okay to doubt. And I, I think that's harmful bordering on abusive sometimes for people in their spiritual development. It's okay to doubt. Let me just say this. It's okay to doubt the resurrection. If you don't, I don't think you're normal personally. I I just don't. It's like, that's not an amazing claim. And doubt is going to be a natural part of that process of, of walking through. What is this story about? What does it mean? Do I believe it? How do I believe it? Um, how do I make sense of it? Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think that's a powerful faith activity that never ends. I've been a Christian since 1972, and it has never left me. And I have struggled that people have characterized me as less than because of it. And I have done it to myself. And that's been harmful, I think, to my journey. Yeah. One of, the, one of the things as I was reading it that troubled me, and this is just my total self-righteousness coming through, like I can't, you know, I, I sort of found myself critiquing the disciples that had seen Jesus already. Mm-hmm. Like, what are you still doing locked away in fear? You've had the Holy Spirit breathed into you. You've seen the resurrected Jesus, and you're still just hiding in fear. And I kind of go like, okay, hold on a second, like David. Uh, these folks have had their dashes and hopes. I mean, their hopes just dashed, right? Like, to what you were saying, Rachel, every expectation they had has crumbled. And then Jesus reveals himself to them, but it's sort of like, like they probably share that news with their families and go, you are insane, right? And so of course they're still locked away. Of course they're still hiding. And of course they're unable to to convince Thomas. No, no, we have truly seen him. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I just, I like to think of myself as, oh man, if Jesus breathed his spirit upon me, man, I would do things for the kingdom that nobody would even believe, right? And it's like, no, I'd probably hide away too, in fear. <laughs> in fear that I would be doubted, in fear that that was a delusion, in fear that it was a fever dream, or in fear that uh, that potentially I would lose my life over it if I left the comfort of my home. So, cool. All right. Anything else on, on what troubles you about the passage? I think the lesson is that is, is exactly that. Um, we're going to have fears and doubts and, and we're going to have moments of indecision. And what do I do? And should I do this? And the story is, is really about, Hey, even though you haven't seen, we saw, 
um, it's okay. You can you can doubt and still step out. Mm. Ooh, me. Funny. Awesome. Okay, second question is, what is reassuring to you about this passage? I think it, for me, was that Christ met him where he was and that he was doubting and he came. And I think I've always read that because of how it's been presented to me as a little bit snarky on Jesus' part, like, here, stick your hands in, whatever. But reading it now... Um, post having gone through a period in my life where I had a lot of doubt, there was a Christ just met him where he was and said, okay, if that's what you need here, stick your hand in. He didn't, um, he didn't continue to hide himself from Thomas, which I think some of us almost go that like, well, no, you just have to have faith and believe even without seeing. And that's the ideal or whatever, but it wasn't Christ just came in, met him where he was at. And, um, showed himself to him and made it real for him. So. Mm. Yeah. I think going off of that, just him, like it's almost like he just invites Thomas into a place of such intimacy with him where he's touching his humanity and his suffering and his healing. And like, that invitation that he offers Thomas is just incredible to see and to, because also like I, in the same way, I heard this passage and immediately the thought that comes to mind is ye of little faith. And like, that's how I perceived it until I read it this time. And similar after having my own journey of doubting and still wrestling and so to see Jesus's response to him in that invitation of intimacy is just um, really powerful to me. Yeah, I don't know when John wrote this book in relationship to when First John was written, but First John opens up with that, you know, that great famous line, the things, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands yeah. concerning the word of life. It reminds me of this moment. And because Thomas is asking to, to touch him, to see him. And then, you know, J John, I think, is framing and picking the stories he wants to pick for the, the current audience. And so if we just project out and say this was written maybe 40 years after Jesus died or so, maybe, maybe longer, maybe sooner, um, they're already doubting that story that happened 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so John picks this story, I think, on purpose to help people in, in those moments. And a lot of those people didn't see what Thomas saw. And so that phrase, you know, you've seen and believed, but blessed are those who without faith believe is a powerful, enduring statement for us ongoing because we, we don't see the resurrected Jesus in the flesh like Thomas did. And we're evidentialists. We want that. Yeah. I, uh, I was reading a commentary today that I that pointed out that um, so after Jesus says, "Put your finger here and see my hands. Put your hand here in the place at my side. Do you uh, do not disbelieve, but believe?" Uh, for the first time, I've never read this before. Thomas responds right away. It doesn't say he even felt the marks. It might even just have been the visual uh, clue, or even like you were saying, Rachel, the invitation into his humanity. Like if you got to go for it. And Thomas's response is my Lord and my God, which is, is a, a, is a, is a um, cosmic claim. Like it's a huge claim. And a lot of scholars think um, that John's gospel actually ended in chapter 20. And that would have been the very last proclamation from the voice of humanity, uh, having been invited into Jesus's suffering, having been invited and, and not being shamed or told, oh my gosh, you have little faith, but saying, here, come see. And it, and then that's why we get the very similar in verse 30 and 31, which is, you know, many more signs have happened. You'll notice that that's repeated in verse 25 of sort of chapter 21. And it's almost like, hey, we want a little bit better of an ending. You know, it's at a little bit more of an ending. So there's a chance it was originally ended with my Lord and my God, you know, just this proclamation uh, 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 by Thomas, the one we vilify or demonize who gets it and claims it. Yeah, it's just cool. Super reassuring to me. 
Um, okay. Well, that's doubting oh, Thomas in the Bible. He's never called doubting Thomas in the Bible. Exactly. And um, the the word doubt doesn't appear in the text. Um, it's believing and unbelieving. And uh, so I, I just I just it's a good thing to, to to be mindful of. Absolutely. That's a great that's a great segue. So let's talk about that. I think we're going to probably talk about belief and faith and doubt um, and trust. So we'll jump straight into that. How, how do, so since doubt doesn't appear in here, and yet the church has clearly labeled Thomas doubting Thomas, talk to me about the relationship between faith and doubt. And if, you, if you're open to be vulnerable, you know, how has doubt affected you and your own faith journey in your life? Or conversely, how has belief affected you in your own faith journey? Kelly and I were talking this morning. I don't know how many of you Emmanuel people know I was pastor for 30 years. And um, we were talking about this passage getting ready for tonight. And um, I remembered writing this journal article from December 9th of 2012. So it was a Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon after church. And I was reflecting on, you know, preaching. And that Sunday I preached on uh, Advent um, as warfare. And uh, I said, I didn't believe in God today. The hardest thing to do is preach about faith when you don't believe. And then I asked some questions of whoever, maybe Kelly, maybe God. Do you really want to know who will listen? You wouldn't understand. You would be shocked. I'm afraid. What do I do with my unbelief? Do I just wait it out? Um, and those days weren't few. Those were, those days came quite a bit. And when you're preaching and you're doubting at the same time, it's, that's a weird experience. And it's, uh, it's okay. I finally came to that place where I said, it's okay. It's, it's just really okay. So I guess my encouragement to people about faith and doubt is um, those moments or those valleys don't affect God's acceptance of you. Um, they're just a struggle, and that's okay. Uh, it's okay to, to dwell in the moment. It's okay to embrace the moment. It's okay to, un, to be unbelieving for a moment. Um, in those moments, I kept doing the things I knew I should be doing, and they were the right things to do. And that, those are the things that you, you just persevere through. Sometimes you don't always do the right thing. Sometimes you fail, but um, unbelief and, and doubt are, are regular parts of life. And they need to be factored in and not used as shameful things either for others or for yourself. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, I think um, kind of two sides, but... I used to work a lot with um, college, like high school, college, a lot of young adults having conversations. And a lot of times in those years, people that have been raised in the church go through periods of doubt. And one of my lines to them was always, God's big enough for all your doubts and all your questions. And what we learn from scripture, especially all those Old Testament kind of things, is transparency seems to be what we're called to be and honesty in those times. And if we can be honest, then God can, you know, continue to work with us, but you need to walk through it in a transparent kind of way. And I think what's hard is we do a, attach a good or a bad to doubt as if it's, it's always bad. So we, like what Steve said with shame, we feel the need to hide it instead of bring it into the light and Embrace it in the sense that we hold it with some gentleness and compassion toward ourselves so that we can walk through it and not attach a negative. Because I think um, whether you call it doubt or unbelief or maybe if you're in a period of pain where you just withdraw or whatever, that um, it's not a negative. I think it's just part of life. It's part of our faith journey. 
And I didn't have that, I, you know, until recently. It was something I walked with other people but hadn't really experienced as much myself. And for me, I found um, that the, my expression of faith during that time was faith that God would meet me on the other side. It wasn't um, that I understood it or that I, it was faith that God would be there when I got through it to the other side. And it wasn't for me a momentary, it was about two years. Of, and then you just keep doing, like Steve said, the things you need to do, going to church, meeting with people, talking, trying to be transparent where you can through that process. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, um, for me, I think I used to think that doubt was like the opposite of faith, but now I've kind of been seeing it more as a stepping stone towards um, maybe a deeper faith. And um, I feel like I could talk about this for days, so I'll try not to. But like, um, I think basically in January, I went on a missionary retreat and was invited to write a lament for the first time. And it was in that lament that some of these questions, um, you know, when you face suffering personally or when you engage with others so closely who suffering is so um, common and pressing and painful. And I mean, we're all going through a collective um, suffering and trauma right now. And so when you, when you face these things and you don't have a way to look away and um, I think for a while there was just like doubt kind of growing in my heart, but I would just try and like stuff it down and believe and um, just not bring that part up because I thought it was bad and I, I didn't want to not believe. And, um, and so I think for me, just being like what you were saying, like, like the honesty before the Lord is just what he desires. And I think there's been just such a place of, of intimacy with him and then reading this passage for the first time kind of in this journey of feeling in the middle in some ways like i just the invitation so the whole time i felt like can i ask these questions to god like can i express this right now this feels like wrong and then just i i just felt him press on my heart like i'm inviting you to engage with me here and so just feeling like, okay, like this is my worship right now. It's bringing my whole heart and not hiding any of it. And so then to read this in light of what I feel like he's been pressing in my heart of just like the way, again, he's inviting Thomas into an intimacy with him because of his honesty, because of his unbelief and, and just being able to come to a place of like, I believe help my unbelief and being honest about it and still turning towards him in it um and just the the intimacy um and the invitation i mean like that's how big our god is and that's how kind and generous he is that like he in he's not afraid of our doubt and just his his presence with us um in it and his view towards us in it is just so beyond gracious and kind. Um, yeah. And there, and, uh, Rachel, I'm so glad you mentioned the lament. I mean, there's a, there's a biblical standard of doubt throughout the entire narrative of scripture. I mean, if you haven't read Psalm 88 or 89, go read that tonight. And you talk about honest questions and anger and frustration. And, and um, on some level, I think, I think doubting is uh or, or unbelief or questioning God, or even, you know, like assaulting God with our requests. Um, in some ways, like you said, Rachel, that actually brings us closer to God versus if I'm just certain in my beliefs, uh, it's just a, it's just an intellectual exercise. Like I don't actually need God for those things. I just know them to be true. And, and, and I, and they become sort of like armor for self-righteousness I want to I want to share a couple of pages out of a book. This I'm not going to hold it up because it'll be backwards. But this is called um, "The Sin of Certainty" by Peter Enns. The Sin of Certainty. It's a very uh, pro provocative title. Uh, not a perfect book, but I, I want to read some of this to you because the way he talks about belief and doubt and trust were really helpful to me. Because for most of my life, I feel like I was taught you got to know what you believe. 
Like you have to know what you believe so you can articulate it, so that you can defend it, so you can prove it. And he's got this great uh, passage where he talks about it. So uh, indulge me if you will. He says, this brings me to a little problem with the word believe or also the word belief. He says, think of how we use the word believe when we talk about our faith. And then he's got these, all these comments and questions. What do you believe in? Really? I don't believe in that at all. Have you ever had that conversation? You believe that? You believe what? Or can you believe what they believe? Or can you believe they believe that? Here's what I believe. Boy, what you believe and what I believe are very different. You couldn't join my ter- church or date my daughter with beliefs like that. Right? That's the sort of the lingo we use. And then he talks about, he talks about how when we think about belief, we're talking about what we think about. So things like, I believe that God exists, and I believe that atheists don't, or I believe that God created the world, or I believe that Jesus is God's son. And that word that, or, or what, that we believe in, Peter Enns says this, look, I'm not against creeds, or talking about what I believe in, but as it's used in the Bible, believing doesn't focus on what someone believes in, but in whom a person places their trust. Not what you believe or what you assent to or what you've intellectually bought into, but belief is about who you trust. And for most of my life, I was trying to create arguments and I was trying to develop the truth about what is right so that I could know what is wrong and more importantly, who was wrong. And Peter Enns has this perfect chapter that was so convicting to me. and I'm going to read it. It's a couple paragraphs. But here's what's a sort of summary of his book, and I encourage you to read it if, if, if faithfulness and doubt and belief and arrogance um, are something you, you uh, manage. Here's what he says. Letting go of the need for certainty is more than just a decision about how we think. It's a decision about how we want to live. When the quest for finding and holding on to certainty is central to our faith, Our lives are marked by these traits. Unflappable dogmatic certainty. Vigilant monitoring of who's in and who's out. Preoccupation with winning debates and defending the faith. Privileging the finality of logical arguments, which is sort of like, look, I've spelled it out for you. If you don't get it, that's on you. Right? Ever been there? I have. And then the lastly is conforming unquestionably to intellectual authorities and celebrities. And he just says, a faith like that is a constant battle. Like a cornered honey badger or like a watchman on the, on the battlement scanning the horizon for sun up or from sun up to sundown for any threat. And I'm just sick of that. Like I'm sick of looking to be right. I'm sick of looking for who I can tear down. And, and as Jesus like blesses Thomas, And as he blesses the disciples with his presence and his peace, um, it brought to mind John 14. This is John 14, verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me, so there's that word that we usually think it means thinking right. Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And so rather than trying to get all my ducks in a row and all my party line set for being a Presbyterian or being a, an evangelical or being an American or, or being this political party or that. He says, trust me and behave like me. That's belief. And so when I hear you guys, Steve, as you, as you had to literally preach through seasons of not even knowing whether the God you're talking about is a God believe in, you're behaving and trusting that he's real. And Kelly, same situation as you, as you navigate tough times, you're going to keep behaving. You're going to keep embodying a trust in a God that you may not feel, or maybe the God that you're wrestling with, or the God that is, feels so absent from you. And that very act is an act of belief. And so I, uh, it's just, it's, it's fun to see Thomas get blessed here, not criticized, not shamed, um, It would have been easy. I feel like if this was an American church, the disciples would have been like, they would have belittled him in front of Jesus. We all got it, right? We saw him. What the heck, man? And instead Jesus goes, man, come closer. Come closer. It's cool. Any any other final thoughts you guys want to share? 
Kelly does. I do? You do. You had a great line this morning that we talked about that you uh, wanted to share. I don't remember what well, that was. replacing things in your head. No. Oh, choosing one thought. You yeah. know, um, one of the things that I've learned over the last four years as I've battled with myself is you have the power, you always have the power to choose one thought over another. Um, and oftentimes it's, that is our greatest power is I can choose to think certain things that are unhealthy and productive, like, and dwell there, or I can choose another thought. So in those times of pain and doubt or unbelief, I can stop myself and go, you know what? I have the power to choose one thought over another thought. And I'm going to choose. And that's, I guess, where faith comes in. I'm going to choose to believe that God is good, that he loves me. And that again, he'll meet me on the other side, even when that's, um, I don't feel it's evident. And I think that going back to what David was saying is in a sense that, we give lip service to the fact that we think we're saved by grace and that we don't earn it and that it's, it's all God's grace. But then we set up all these markers of you have to believe this, this, and this. And we kind of throw that out the window. We don't see it that way, but it's in essence what we do. And I just came to the conclusion that God's grace embraces my doubt and it embraces my unbelief. And he's not saying you have to reach this level of faith or it wasn't enough. He's just, offered his grace and um and it's enough fortunately for me it's not dependent on my faith being enough um it's dependent on his grace amen anybody else you sure this is your last chance it's actually not like the reason i'm doing this is so that everybody at emmanuel goes look there's another preaching voice so all <laughs> three of you will be asked to preach at emmanuel in the near future i mean gosh darn i can't wait <laughs> i'm Be just good. thinking i'm gonna go to coffee with rachel and hash this out some more after this is all over <laughs> sounds good coffee dates, coffee dates all the way around well guys thank you so much for spending the time uh, to meet uh, online Emmanuel, thank you for, for worshiping together. Um, at this point in the service, uh, we're going to ask you to ask, uh, answer the same three questions. What troubles you about the passage? What is reassuring to you about this passage? And then how do faith and doubt relate? And in your own faith journey, how, have, have, how has belief or how has trust or how has doubt um, af affected your, your own spiritual growth? Okay, so I have to say yeah. one more thing. Go for it. Um, I just want to thank you, David, and Emmanuel in general for providing us, Steve and I, a faith place to come when we were doubting. Um, and I felt like I didn't have to hide any of that. And that safety was a huge part in overcoming it. So well, thank you. And it's my great privilege, and we are better off for you guys being here. So uh, what a gift. Uh, all three of you and all of you at Emmanuel, um, have been to this church. So enjoy, enjoy the rest of your day, enjoy your worship, and we'll, uh, we'll catch up soon next time. Take care, everybody. Peace.